Well, first of all, uh, as a footnote to last lecture, the book I mentioned uh, about the Battle of Agincourt is John Keegan's uh, The Face of Battle. It has a whole chapter on Agincourt. If you're interested in the historical details of the battle, why the English actually won, and the controversies about it, it's a very good treatment of it. Many people regard this as the best book of military history ever. It's about four great battles that changed history. Also, uh, I hope you all got the email that we're moving the um, due date of the second paper uh, up to December 4th. Are there any objections to that? <laughs> if anyone wants to be beaten up by his or her classmates, raise your objection right now. But no, it seemed fair enough. Again, uh, I had to make up the reading list uh, before I knew the due date of the final exam. Now that we see it's in the next century, we might as well give you the advantage of that, take a little more time on the paper. Uh, also, I did speak to the person who's uh, in charge of these recordings. They will not be available this semester. It's complicated negotiations on Showtime's involved, HBO, the History Channel, uh, Fox is in the bidding, and uh, anyway, no, there's some problems with getting the rights on this, and so um, unfortunately they'll not be available. Uh, though for the right fee, I'll repeat any one of the lectures out in the hallway for anybody. I, I'm not going to see any money off these videos. I might as well uh, see something on the side. Uh, okay, I think that's all the announcements for, for today. So, uh, one thing we're looking at in Henry V uh, is the distinctive problems of a Christian monarchy. This is kind of the theme of the course from now on, how Christianity introduces complications into politics, certainly a central theme of Machiavelli, uh, as you can see in the uh, discourses. Uh, on a very simple, straightforward level, we see in this play uh, how powerful the Catholic Church was as a political institution uh, in the late Middle Ages uh, in Henry V's time. And one thing we see very strongly at the beginning of the play is a monarch in a Christian country has to get the Catholic Church behind him because his interests do not always coincide with those uh, of his monarchy. Now again, I'll remind you, in the ancient world, uh, time of a play like Coriolanus, uh, uh, religion was... Uh, uh, coextensive with the political community. Uh, uh, Athenians had an Athenian religion. You couldn't live in Athens and have a Spartan religion. Uh, uh, each of these ancient cities uh, had a religion built into the regime. What it was to be an Athenian uh, was to practice uh, certain religious rituals and rites that were associated with Athens. Yes, the Greeks had uh, common gods, we all know that, and in a sense they had a common language, but, it's, uh, but uh, uh, all these, this common language had distinct dialects. Uh, the ancient Greek we study is the, Greek, the dialect of Athens, it's Attic Greek. Sparta had a different um, uh, uh, dialect. In effect, you could say for each of these cities, religion had a different dialect. Uh, they practiced different rites associated with the city. Uh, the, the religion was absorbed into the regime. Now, Christianity is a trans-political religion. It is not bound by a particular political community. Indeed, it presents itself as a universal uh, religion. It may well be that's why it was so suited ultimately to the Roman Empire, so that although Roman emperors per persecuted it for centuries, a Eventually, Christianity was adopted as the official religion uh, of the Roman Empire. Uh, and while the U Roman Empire was this universal community in its own eyes, Christianity was its religion. Uh, once the Roman Empire broke up, you started to have separate states, but still this uniform uh, Christianity across the borders. Uh, the idea of the famous Holy Roman Emp Emperor uh, was an attempt to reunify uh, Catholic Christianity uh, through all the nations of Europe. Didn't, it was largely a fiction, uh, but it's an indication of the problem we're talking about here. So uh, uh, Shakespeare shows here what the problem uh, was for a monarch in Henry's time. Now eventually, uh, under the Tudor monarchy, under Henry VIII, 
uh, Henry created a Church of England. He broke with the Church of Rome, as it was often called, and created a national church of which he was the head, and he now appointed the bishops, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, and not the Pope. Uh, Shakespeare's writing with a good deal of hindsight in this play. Uh, many people have seen it as an attempt to justify uh, the Tudor policy. Uh, and you can see the germ of the Tudor policy in those opening scenes uh, when Parliament has introduced a bill uh, to seize the church lands. Now that's historically what happened. If you got the signet, you can look at pages 138 to 139 in Shakespeare's principal source, the Hollandshead's Chronicle, and you'll see that all that stuff at the opening of the play is right there uh, in Hollandshead. Uh, but I can't help thinking that Shakespeare is showing Henry V here as a forerunner of Henry VIII. Uh, that Henry VIII precisely, uh, by breaking with the Catholic Church and making himself the head of the church in England, seized all those church lands, the monasteries, the nunneries, this incredible wealth the Catholic Church had built up. And that, of course, stripped the church of its power and at the same time enormously increased Henry's, Henry VIII's power vis-a-vis -vis the nobles because he now had so much more land. Moreover, he used that land to create new nobles who were directly loyal to him. Uh, so as many people have pointed out, and, and you've been asking about contemporary political relevance uh, in these plays, uh, this play seems to be an attempt to justify Tudor policy uh, uh, ahead of the game. However, Shakespeare's deeper than that, and the play really raises uh, the deeper question uh, of the compatibility of Christianity and uh, modern politics, namely Christianity is a religion of peace. That's certainly the way it presents itself. And how does a warrior king uh, operate with a religion that's a religion of peace. Uh, now, as we all know, Christianity has often been used to justify war. Uh, and the most notable example of that was the Crusades in the late Middle Ages. And uh, uh, in this set of four plays, uh, the Crusades are more prominent than you could tell from just reading Henry V. Uh, 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 knights and Richard II talk about going off to fight in the Holy Land. Henry IV is constantly talking about leading a new cr uh, uh, crusade to recapture the Holy Land. Uh, Henry V has transferred that ambition to the more practic practical task of conquering France, but at the very end you see that hope uh, that a united France and England could uh, 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 retake Constantinople from the Turk. An anachronism, because Battle of Agincourt is 1415, the Turks didn't conquer uh, uh, Constantinople until 1453. But the hint of a crusade is still there. So Shakespeare is very much aware that uh, this religion of peace is often invoked in war. And indeed, uh, Henry V begins with, in effect, the Catholic Church giving its sanction to war against France and the appearance is even that the, the church is pushing this war uh, upon, uh, upon Henry. Uh, and of course, we saw Henry is crucially dependent on men like the marvelous McMorris, who can say, I would have blowed up the town, Christ saved me. Uh, but as Shakespeare shows that in some people, their Christianity does not run that deep. They, they don't find it incompatible with cutting off other people's heads. And really, Henry is crucially dependent upon that fact of human nature. Uh, one thing that Shakespeare is very aware of is how human beings can hold contradictory values in their minds at the same time. And indeed, I argue that the function of his tragic writing a la Hegel's formula, is to expose the contradictions in our values that we normally don't, uh, uh, we're normally not aware of because we don't like to think that our loyalty to our country might be incompatible with our loyalty to our religion or any such issue. But Shakespeare tends to make us think about those things, which is why he's such an important uh, writer. Uh, so we see throughout this play the... Uh, uh, what I'll call its Renaissance texture, namely the way it's always uh, 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 alternating between classical 
and Christian uh, alternatives. Uh, you see it neatly just uh, on page 20, which would be uh, the chorus that opens Act 2. Uh, this image, uh, line 6 to 7 in the prologue, following the mirror of all Christian kings with winged heels as English Mercuries. There you see it, the Christian kings, and then this touch of paganism, uh, English Mercuries, these figures that out of uh, 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 Roman, Roman mythology uh, uh, here. Uh, and indeed, the point about Henry V is that he's able to do consciously and by control what kind of jumbles around in McMorris's mind. Uh, look at page 87, uh, which is Act 4, Scene 3. Uh, so Act 4, Scene 3, about line 15 uh, there, where Bedford says of Henry, he is as full of valor as of kindness, princely in both. Now this is too good for us because we've already read Coriolanus. Now remember, Shakespeare has not written Coriolanus yet, but in Coriolanus we saw the pagan world defined by the notion that valor is held the chiefest virtue. And I talked about there that, then that, you know, in our society today, maybe you couldn't get up and say valor uh, is held to be the chiefest virtue. Indeed, you'd get a lot more applause and understanding in our society if you got up and said kindness is held to be the chiefest virtue. In a sense, kindness is held to be the chiefest virtue in our society. Uh, we, ad we admire people who exhibit kindness. Now, <laughs> the amazing th thing here, then, is how this combines the classical and the Christian. Really, you can define this ancient world, especially the pagan world, the world of, of warriors, as a world where valor is held to be the chiefest virtue. Uh, the Christian world is the world where kindness is held to be the chiefest virtue. Uh, and it's not easy to be both. Uh, believe me, I've tried. <laughs> it's very difficult to be both valorous and kind. The kind of person who's valorous often isn't a nice guy, uh, as we saw in Coriolanus, and often people who are kind by nature uh, are not so great on the battlefield. By the way, Shakespeare had shown that about Henry's son, Henry VI. Uh, again, he'd written plays, three plays about Henry VI, before this play and early in his career. And the point he shows about Henry VI is he was just too Christian. He was just too meek. He was always turning the other cheek, and the barons walked all over him, and the French walked all over him. In fact, there's a moment in Henry VI where one of the barons gets up and says, you know, I'm more like Achilles than you are. I mean, that's what he says. I'm fit to carry Achilles' spear. You, Henry VI, are not. Uh, you're fit to be in a monastery. It's an incredible passage, very early in Shakespeare, uh, where he shows the problematic of a truly Christian king, of one who would, you know, be more happy in a monastery than on a battlefield. The point about Henry V that makes him so extraordinary and why Shakespeare seems to offer him as the model king is that he can combine valor and kindness. It's no easy trick. Uh, uh, but we do, do see it in the play. So uh, his challenge, uh, deeper in a way than his challenge to control the Catholic Church, is his uh, challenge to take a Christian people and still uh, make warriors out of them. Uh, and he is able to do that. Uh, uh, we see it in the uh, great uh, St. Crispin's Day speech, which is on the next page, uh, uh, page 88, uh, so still in Act 4, Scene 3. This is where he, he's trying to inspire his troops into battle, and this is where he says those lines I began with, lines 28 and 29, but if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive, and I'll remind you that under Christianity it is a sin to covet honor, but he understands that when you're motivating troops, uh, it's not a time to talk about kindness, it's not a talk of time to invoke the Christian virtues of mercy. They're outnumbered. Their lives are threatened. Uh, this is the time to, in, uh, to invoke honor. And he gives this famous speech that English schoolboys were forced to memorize for generations. Uh, and the whole uh, focus is uh, on the spirit of honor, 
uh, line 41 on page 88 in Act 4, Scene 3, he that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named uh, and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian, and then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars. Yeah, something that Coriolanus was not willing to do, but we're, we're getting back into the world of pagan Rome here uh, uh, and uh, the world of Volumnia, the world where you're proud of your scars, uh, and say, these wounds I had on Christmas Day, old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names familiar in his mouth as household words, ha words Harry the King. <laughs> Let me pause there. That, that Henry V likes to be known as Harry, uh, the English diminutive of Henry. Uh, a little touch of Harry in the night, as we hear in the prologue. And that's a real indication of his political strategy of popularity. Uh, this is a king who... who wants to bridge the gap with his people, who doesn't want to seem aloof and distant uh, uh, from them. We'll see that in a minute as he moves among his troops. But just that little touch that he will be known as Harry. Uh, I can't picture Coriolanus being known as Corey, uh, <laughs> one of the many Corys. Uh, 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 but who are, yeah, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, uh, uh, be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. Uh, now, by the way, you know, uh, here he is enlisting the barons. Uh, the nobles are a problem, a potential challenge uh, to the king. Uh, but you see here that he's giving them an outlet for their glory. Shakespeare, as I was telling you, was very aware of the problematic situation that was in his own England when a lot of the nobles didn't feel they were getting a chance to act out their aggressive impulses. They were being reined in from warring with the Spanish. Henry understands you got, uh, uh, to keep the nobles on a leash every once in a while, you've got to set them loose to attack somebody, in this case the French. Uh, and Crispin, Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. Now this is the classical ideal of fame again. He's not appealing to they're going to have they're going to have a nice afterlife if they win. No, they will be famous forever. And then these famous lines that have got recycled, recycled in uh, 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 all sorts of war movies: "We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother." Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst my any speaks that fought upon us, uh, fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. You really see here what it is for Henry to be a king of a whole nation, uh, to enlist the whole of his people behind him. Yes, the nobles, but also the common people. And be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. I don't know if that's literally true, but the idea is you do well in this battle and you're going to advance in social station. You know, it's like the, the nobles, each one will get an even better title. And a lot of the common people will become sirs now. They'll be knighted because of what they do in the battle. Again, this is not what Coriolanus would say. He can give some pretty good battlefield speeches, but he mainly tries to shame his troops uh, into battle. Uh, there's a lot of stick in Coriolanus. There's a lot more carrot in Henry V here. Uh, this is an implicit promise. Uh, that do well in this battle, uh, 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 you will prosper from it. And you see Westmoreland's response at line 75, God's will, my liege, would you I alone without more help could fight this royal battle. And indeed, the, the, the troops uh, rally behind him. Uh, and if this speech isn't enough, uh, uh, Henry goes underground. Uh, 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 we see that. Uh, just before uh, in Act 4, Scene 1, when he moves uh, among his troops. Now, this is a very significant scene in terms of 
uh, what I'm calling Shakespeare's program for English king kingship. We saw in Antony Cleopatra the problem of uh, when him we serves away and that notion that Ventidius articulates that Caesar and Antony have uh, always won, uh, have ever won more in their lieutenants than in person. Henry is not going to be that kind of ruler. He leads his troops into battle. Moreover, uh, uh, he wants to be close to them. He wants to move among them, and uh, he really is testing them out the night before the battle. This is in sharp contrast to the French, uh, it's perhaps Shakespeare's suggestion of why the, the English win. The French king is completely absent, and these French nobles are more interested in their mistresses and their horses than they are in the common people. And you never see the French uh, leaders addressing the common people. Henry not only speaks to them in his position as king, uh, uh, he moves among them. Uh, and uh, it is interesting he must do so in disguise. Uh, he does understand the problem uh, of a king's access to the truth about his people. Uh, again, I have to fill things in for you. This is something he very much learned uh, in the earlier plays, particularly Henry IV, part one. He comes to understand that a great occupational hazard of a monarch is that people flatter him and they don't tell him the truth, uh, and he learns to go on masquerades there so he can hear the truth from the common people. And that comes in very handy here. Again, as Henry V, his troops aren't going to tell him what uh, they feel. As Harry Leroy, <laughs> uh, he can learn the truth uh, here. Uh, and uh, it's very significant that uh, in Act 4, Scene 1, uh, the dialogue's in prose, Again, it's Shakespeare's indication that Henry is going underground here. He's not playing the public role of the monarch, speaking in blank verse. He, uh, he meets the people on their own level, which is the level of prose. This is an extraordinary scene. I, I really don't have time to go through all of it. Uh, but looking on page 77, so Act 4, Scene 1, line 103, uh, uh, the speech that begins, for though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. Now, that's, of course, literally true. <laughs> he is Henry V. Uh, but, of course, uh, it appears to be a major concession because he's only Harry Leroy at this point, uh, uh, not uh, acknowledging that he's king. Uh, and uh, this speech is quite remarkable and helps define what's special about Henry V. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me. The element shows to him as it doth to me. All his senses uh, have, hum have but human conditions. His ceremony is laid by. In his nakedness, he appears but a man. Uh, this is a central insight that comes up in many of Shakespeare's portrayals of monarchs. Happens to Richard II. If you know King Lear, it's the ultimate insight uh, that King Lear uh, uh, comes to learn. Uh, Shakespeare was aware of what makes some humans noble and makes them stand above the common level of humanity, but he never lets us forget that ultimately kings are not gods, they're not a distinct order of human beings, and, and notice everything depends upon the body here, the violet smells to him as it doth to me. The element shows to him as it doth to me. Insofar as kings are human beings, they have basically the same bodies as other human beings do. King Lear is a very similar intimation when he's cast off naked into a storm uh, and feels the cold. Uh, what's interesting about Henry V, though, is that he doesn't need adversity to come to this recognition. In the other cases, uh, Shakespeare shows kings after their fall, after Richard II has been deposed, he comes to understand he's just a man. After King Lear has been in effect deposed and is cast off on the heath, he comes to recognize this. I might say that in the case of Cleopatra, only after she's lost everything does she then come to the conclusion, tis paltry to be Caesar. This would be as if at the height of her power, Cleopatra said, 
tis paltry to be Caesar. I'm trying to get you to see what's more remarkable about Henry here, what's more, we would say, philosophical about him. Now, it's true he's in a tough situation here, and he's very nervous about the following day, but he ain't lost yet, uh, and he's not going to, and he's going to try not to do so. So, I, I, you know, this is not said in a moment of defeat, uh, and I'm saying it makes him the most philosophical of Shakespeare's kings because he's able to have these insights uh, uh, while he's still in power, uh, while his body hasn't been punished by storms and other ways. And it, it, it's very significant that he comes to these uh, conclusions. He then gets involved in what is almost a philosophical dialogue uh, uh, with his uh, troops here, uh, uh, bottom of page 77, so line 128, uh, Henry in disguise says, Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company, his cause being just and his quarrel being honorable. And then in one of those incredibly honest moments from one of the soldiers, that's more than we know. <laughs> and uh, Wait, this is what Henry wants to find out. Uh, what are my troops thinking uh, on the eve of this battle? And he's trying to rally them to his cause that, you know, the king's cause is just. We all got to rally around him. Right, guys? And they say, hmm. Uh, and indeed, Bates says, oh, I or more than we should seek after, for we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. And that's exactly what Henry doesn't want to hear. It's the reverse of that strategy we've seen in him again and again up to this point. He always manages to transfer the blame to someone else. We attack France? Well, the church demanded it. I had no say in the matter. Uh, you nobles uh, uh, are asking for mercy? Well, you just said that I shouldn't be merciful. Normally I'm merciful, but it's your fault. Harfleur, uh, are you going to surrender? Because if you don't surrender, it's going to be your fault when my soldiers start to rape and pillage. He's, this is, in a sense, the core of his Machiavellianism, uh, that he's always able to hide behind someone else and, and impute the blame to someone else. Uh, and now he sees the trick being done to him. And this is a very complicated passage here. Again, I don't want to go through it line by line. It would take a bit too much uh, time. But Williams actually makes a very good argument uh, here that... Uh, 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 the soldiers shouldn't be blamed uh, <coughs> for the injustice of the king's <coughs> cause. And if they die, um, the about line 146, now if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it, who to disobey were against all proportion of subjection. So basically, it's the argument, uh, I was only following orders. Uh, now I put it in those terms so you will see that this is a uh, dangerous belief to have in your troops. If they th uh, it's their uh, abrogation of all moral responsibility. Uh, Henry can't have that. Uh, uh, for one thing, it puts too much of a burden on himself to have the entire moral burden of the war, war on him. him. Also, he doesn't like the idea that the troops will just abandon all sense of morality. We saw him earlier order them not to rape and pillage in France, even though, as we've seen all the way since Coriolanus, that to rape and pillage is unfortunately uh, what a lot of soldiers are, are, are in war too. Uh, so Henry proceeds to give uh, what I will uh, just dogmatically assert, assert is an entirely specious argument here. If you look at the speech that begins at line 150, uh, uh, there is a distinction between a father sending his son uh, on a shopping trip and a king ordering his soldiers into war. Uh, dying is more integral to the latter activity than it is to shopping. Uh, uh, but you see here, actually, uh, 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 the way Henry is a master of rhetoric uh, and able to talk to the common people uh, and, indeed, uh, to uh, talk them into uh, anything uh, here. Uh, and, indeed, he works very hard to separate uh, the moral status of the soldiers from the moral status of the king. 
again, I wish I could go through this in great detail, but we'd be here all day on that. But just quickly, line 81, uh, the remarkable line, every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Uh, I mean, that's the heart of his teaching here, which is to maintain moral responsibility among the troops. I will also just state that it's the heart of Protestantism as opposed to Catholicism. <laughs> now, again, this is not Henry VIII, the first the, the man, the king who took England into Protestantism. But again, Shakespeare seems to be pointing that direction with this play. The doctrine that every subject's soul is his own is a very strongly Protestant doctrine. Uh, it was, in effect, Martin Luther's major claim that the Catholic Church was not the mediator between the individual soul and God, uh, that every, uh, uh, every Christian had a direct relation to God. That's why Luther translated the Bible into German so that uh, the German people could read the Bible themselves and not be reliant on the church to tell them what was in it. Uh, when the Bible was only available in Latin and so on. That's, that's a re remarkable resonance uh, to that line. And Henry <laughs> manages to convince the soldiers, line 191, to certain every man that dies ill, the ill upon his own head, the king is not to answer. Henry has turned it around back to his old strategy there, uh, the ill upon his own head. Uh, gee, I'm just thinking that I think is the same a uh, line of Canterbury, the sin upon my head. Yeah, look at it, page 12. I just saw it, page 12 versus page 79. Uh, 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 upon his own head, upon my... Yeah, Shakespeare's making a connection here in, 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 in Henry's strategy uh, uh, here. Uh, and so we, in, in some ways we see Henry at his best in this... Uh, a scene again. Again, I want to stress uh, the the closeness to his troops here. You know, this band of brothers, we happy few. You know, <laughs> Octavius Caesar isn't creating a band of brothers when he talks about uh, his soldiers. He says, uh, "Feed them. We we have the waste to do it." Gives you some idea of his attitude towards his troops, but. Whether this is sincere or not, we will never know, but this is what, uh, at least the appearance Henry presents, uh, is of solidarity with the troops, both here and his public role uh, in the St. Christmas Day speech. Uh, so these are some of the ways in which we see how admirable Henry V is. Again, I think this is Shakespeare's said He had a lot to work with. The actual Henry V was very admirable. Uh, monarch. He was very much admired, even in Shakespeare's day. And so Shakespeare takes that and shapes it a bit to offer what he thinks would be about the best you can expect from a monarch. However, there's a dark side to Henry, and this is what complicates the play. I want to start on page 97. Uh, uh, this is Act 4, Scene 6, when uh, they're learning of who's died, and uh, 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 line 30, Exeter begins to weep, but I had not so much a man in me, and all my mother came into my eyes and gave me up tears. I blame you not, says Henry, for hearing this, I must perforce compound with misful eyes, or they will issue too. Again, we do not see Coriolanus crying. We do not see Roman generals crying on the battlefield uh, until maybe the end of Julius Caesar when their mood starts to turn. But again, this is a reminder that these are Christians uh, here, uh, uh, and they can't take that pure pagan delight in battle that Shakespeare's Romans do. Uh, uh, with misful eyes, but hark! This is line 35. What new alarm is the same? The French have reinforced their scattered men. Then every soldier kill his prisoners. I want to dwell on how extraordinary this moment is, and then we'll see even more how extraordinary it is. Uh, this order to execute the prisoners goes against every law uh, of war, and especially the laws of medieval chivalry. Notice the next scene, uh, uh, scene seven, uh, Flewellen enters saying, kill the boys and the luggage, it is expressly against the law of arms. This is a juxtaposition that Shakespeare must intend. 
because killing the prisoners is also against the law of arms. Uh, now, to, just to put this in some perspective for you, to this day, this is against the Geneva Convention. This is considered a war crime. Uh, many Germans and Japanese were executed after World War II for acts like this. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, uh, especially when you consider that prisoners have often surrendered, uh, they have done so in order not to die. <laughs> uh, and so uh, to turn around and kill them, it's just, this is a horrible act. Now, it's, uh, to, you know, again, to this day, this is regarded as a war crime, uh, to execute prisoners. Uh, in the Middle Ages, you can ratchet up a whole nother notch because we're in the world of chivalry. Just go up page 97 to line 19. We kept together in our chivalry. The notion of chivalry is still prevailing in the world of this play. And as bad as it is to execute prisoners now, in the days of chivalry, it's over the top. It's, it, it's arguably the worst war crime possible. I will add that uh, in terms of medieval warfare, prisoners were very important because they paid for the wars. Uh, uh, the big thing you did in a battle was capture the nobility on the other side and then ransom them. Uh, and that ransom, in effect, paid for the war. It's very easy to take nobles prisoner because they were in this armor, and if you ever got them off the horse, that was it. They couldn't move, and you just had to cart them back, and you had your, your bounty there. So uh, Keegan discusses this uh, um, uh, very well in face of battle, and stresses uh, you know, how, how, uh, how much greater uh, this was against the laws of war in the Middle Ages. Uh, now, it, uh, Keegan actually goes through the debate about it. Uh, uh, Henry had his back to the wall here. Uh, uh, the English are incredibly outnumbered by the French. At this point, they've taken so many prisoners, even the prisoners outnumber them. <laughs> you know, forget the whole French army. Uh, the, so, I mean, uh, w when the battle started heating up again, uh, Henry was faced with a possibility of being caught between the prisoners he'd taken and the newly attacking French, and so he did execute the prisoners. Uh, you, this is in Holland's head. It's on page 158 in your signet. You can look it up. Uh, so Shakespeare makes us confront uh, the blackest mark in uh, Henry's history just as a warrior king, but now let's just introduce the notion of Christian king. Uh, this is particularly uh, uh, bad stuff for a Christian king uh, to execute the prisoners. Uh, and uh, uh, again, king, uh, historians to this date uh, debate the morality of this move. It seems to be uh, the ultimate moment in politics when you're faced with a choice between survival and your morality. Uh, Everything moral in Henry would dictate not killing the prisoners. Uh, yet, if he is himself to survive, and if his army is to survive, and if England is to survive, he must do so. Now, Shakespeare ratchets this up another level uh, uh, on page 99 with another one of these strange double revelations. Uh, that is, if you look at pay, uh, what we, in the interim, we've learned that the, the French have violated the law of arms. Uh, by attacking the baggage train of the army where women and boys uh, who did things like the cooking and uh, the, 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 the French, uh, perhaps out of pure malice, have killed these, uh, we would call, uh, innocent non-combatants. Uh, but look at uh, page 99, so still Act 4, scene 7, about line 55. Henry enters saying, I w <laughs> with prisoners, I was not angry since I came to France unto this instant. Take a trumpet, herald, ride thou unto the horsemen on yon hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come down, or void the field, they do offend our sight. If they'll do neither, we will come to them and make them scur away as swift as stones and force from the old Assyrian slings. Besides, we'll cut the throats of those we have, and not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. 
go and tell them. Notice Assyrian slings. He's being associated here with pagan warriors. And he now presents the killing of the prisoners as a reaction. Uh, uh, the French have violated the laws of arm. They've killed our, our boys. Uh, in retaliation, I will now kill the prisoners. Uh, now, uh, this evidently has not troubled too many critics. I've not seen uh, much commentary on it. Uh, we're tuned into it, I think, by the double, re double revelation of Portia's death, which we saw in Julius Caesar. By the way, the play Shakespeare probably wrote right after Henry V. Uh, I think the two moments should reinforce uh, the situation in our mind that I think Shakespeare... Uh, was capable of showing just this. That is, there, I'm, if they even noticed it, I'm sure some te textual critics would say the text is, text is corrupt here. In one version, Shakespeare had Henry give the order before the battle. Uh, in another version, he had him give it after the battle, and somehow the texts have gotten confused. No, I think it's a deliberate strategy in light of what we've seen uh, as Henry's overall strategy always to transfer the blame. He initiated the killing of the prisoners on page 97, but now he suggests the French initiated the problem. The French violated the law of arms, and now I'm free to violate the law of arms uh, in return. Incidentally, just to uh, show how, in effect, controversial this is, in Laurence Olivier's film, both moments are omitted. <laughs> Uh, now, again, that's very much a World War II film, uh, and I don't, I think wisely, Olivier didn't want to show an English king ordering the uh, killing of prisoners when the Germans were holding so much English prisoners at that time. In Branagh's film, uh, only the second uh, order is there. Uh, I, I think directors have sensed how dark this moment is. Uh, and when they... Uh, uh, they're trying to present Henry as a heroic figure. They don't want to bring this up. Uh, notice how Machiavellian it is uh, that having done this very dubious deed, uh, Henry turns around and tries to give a moral col coloring to it. This is the, exactly the sort of thing Machiavelli would call for. Uh, uh, Certainly Machiavelli would say, if you have to, execute the prisoners. But if there's any way you can make it look more decent, then go for it. And that's what we see with Henry here. Uh, as I say, <laughs> uh, very few people discuss this moment. The directors seem to try to suppress it. I think it is historically true. It's discussed in Holland's head. You can see it on page 158. Uh, in fact, I'll just point to you. Uh, it is rather interesting what Holland's head says. If you look at the bottom of 158, uh, uh, Holland's head describes this as contrary to his accustomed gentleness. That's an understatement if I ever heard one. Cold-bloodedly executing prisoners of war, contrary to your accustomed gentleness. So it's, you know, uh, there may be a political teaching here. I hesitate to formulate it, but it might be something like this, uh, that there are moments in political life and especially in warfare where all rules become irrelevant. I mean, when sheer survival is at stake, and again, not just of yourself, but of your army and arguably of your whole nation, you have to do terrible things. That's a very Machiavellian lesson. Uh, the further Machiavellian lesson would be, if you can possibly put a good face on it after the fact, do it. Uh, and I will say that this does help us distinguish Shake, uh, Henry V from the evil kings in Shakespeare. Uh, again, I'm trying to show you how subtle Shakespeare's political thought is. Shakespeare isn't saying that a good king is a goody-goody. Uh, that a good king is a moral king who always does what's moral, uh, who never does anything wrong. Uh, 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 what he is showing is even a good king is going to have to and uh, is going to have to do some nasty things. But what's interesting is that Henry does not boast about it, and indeed he does his best to conceal it. 
again, it would be nice if we were reading Richard III, uh, Shakespeare's fullest portrait of an evil king, and Richard III just delights in doing evil. He just can't stop talking about it. Uh, <laughs> I did it. I'm proud. Wasn't it great the way I cheated them? And look how I killed them. And, uh, and uh, Shakespeare's uh, aware of this distinction. Uh, Henry oversimplifies it back on page 17. Uh, uh, this is Act 1, Scene 2, Line 241. We are no tyrant, but a Christian king. That makes it very neat. There are tyrants and there are Christian kings. What we see with the business of the prisoners of war is that even this Christian king can do very unchristian things uh, like murder prisoners, yet he does not glory in it. He understands he needs to suppress it. Uh, this is, it will sound terrible, but you know, for the sake of morality, Henry is a hypocrite. Uh, in or he understands there are times when the moral rules need to be suspended, but he doesn't want to eat away the moral rules, and so he does this exception, uh, and yet does everything he can to cover it over as if he really didn't act immorally. And now you can say, uh, you know, I'm not sure what Shakespeare's ultimate judgment on this. You can say Henry's just the ultimate Machiavellian. A guy like Richard III is too transparently Machiavellian. He does Machiavellian things and then brags about them as Machiavellian. That's not the greatest Machiavellian thing to do. You might say that Henry V is the ultimate Machiavellian because he does these Machiavellian things and manages to maintain a reputation for piety by a form of hypocrisy. But, I'm, you know, that made denigrate him too much. I think Shakespeare may be trying to show, you know, this amazing man that can be valorous and kind at the same time. Indeed, leading into this, we see him weeping, weeping over the death of uh, some of his friends, and then he turns on a dime. Uh, that's what's so extraordinary about this man. Uh, uh, he's not, uh, you know, a savage warrior who can't make the transition to peace, which is basically the way Shakespeare portrays Coriolanus and Richard III, for that matter. On the other hand, he's not a kind, gentle Christian king like Henry VI, who can never rise to the challenge of war. Uh, he does seem to be this extraordinarily comprehensive human being uh, who has both sides, valor and kindness, uh, and can turn on the valor when he has to and turn it off. Because again, once the, once the battle is won, uh, page 100, uh, uh, this is Act 4, Scene 7, uh, praise be God and not our strength for it. Uh, now, again, this is Shakespeare's Richard III, uh, takes all the credit for the battles he wins and uh, is very happy to talk about it. This, of course, seems like a tremendous act of piety, which in some sense it is. How deep it runs, uh, we don't know in the sense that this is, is both an act of piety and an act of Machiavellian strategy because it's all in Henry's interest here to talk about God being responsible for the win in the battle. Uh, it's not, I won this battle by my incredibly shrewd move of killing the prisoners. I mean, he could have said that. Uh, any other king might have been too weak and too morally concerned to kill the prisoners, but I knew it had to be done, and I did it. Uh, but no, praise be God. That's great. That covers it all over. Uh, and notice, by the way, praise be God and not my generals. Not my nobles. Remember, we've seen this since Ventidius and Antony Cleopatra. We talked about this a lot. The problem to a single uh, individual ruler when he has these barons, these generals who, who help him win battles or win his battles for him, it's really great to praise God instead of your generals here. Now he's told the generals they're going to do well, they'll, they'll get rewards and so on. But, but this aura of piety uh, that Henry creates around the battle uh, is very suspiciously Machiavellian. Uh, 
one passage I've never understood fully or maybe at all, page 83, uh, the moment when Henry speaks to God before the battle. Uh, now this is important because this is a soliloquy. Everything else is said in public and may have political motives. I mean, when he praises God and has a Te Deum song, that, that may all be for pu public consumption. Here's a moment of privacy where Henry uh, 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 prays to God. So pay, this is Act 4, Scene 1, about line 294. Uh, I will say that, I mean, many people point to this as the great uh, speech of piety on Henry's part. But is it? <laughs> Notice he addresses, O oh God of battles. That's a very strange title for the Christian God. Uh, it doesn't, it's not Jesus. He does not address Jesus in this speech. God of battles is, sounds like an Old Testament God. Uh, in fact, it even sounds like a pagan God, a God of battles. Uh, and again, I, without going through all of this, what he instructs God to do is not invoke morality. Uh, line, line 297. Not today, O Lord, O not today. Think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. And again, uh, his father, Henry IV, uh, essentially killed Richard II in order to become a king. And Henry V now says, I've done all these things. This is historically true uh, uh, for Richard's body uh, and for his soul. Uh, line 307, more will I do, though all that I can do is nothing worth, since that my penitence comes after all, imploring pardon. Uh, file us away for when we get to Hamlet. Uh, it's very strange that it's King Claudius who makes a speech almost identical to this. Uh, I think it's actually scene two, uh, just when Hamlet come, comes upon him in the chapel and is thinking of killing him, where Claudius says, forgive me, God, I'm a usurper. And then even Claudius realizes, wait a minute, I'm still king. I've got the benefits of my crime. I can't be asking for forgiveness while I still enjoy the benefits of the crime. It's essentially what Henry says here. So this, this evident speech of piety here uh, has a very, very strong evidence of impiety in it. Above all, instructing God, forget about morality for one day uh, here. And again, the address to God about us. Again, I, it's a very peculiar speech. I'm calling attention to its peculiarity. Many people say, oh, Henry must be pious. Look at this address to God. If you look at it carefully, it's pretty strange. Uh, uh, okay, let, any questions thus far? Uh, Okay, there's a lot more to be said about these battle scenes, but I do want to finish the play and stay on schedule. So let's quickly turn to Act 5, and then we'll come back to some of the stuff earlier uh, in the play. Act 5 is a little strange. It may seem to you anticlimactic. Indeed, uh, the play could you know, well end on page 108, uh, with the singing of the Te Deum, and in the Brano film where this scene goes on for 22 minutes or something, you may, may well think it is the end. Uh, uh, Shakespeare adds what I'll describe uh, almost as an epilogue uh, in Act 5 here, uh, which uh, takes us mainly to the scene of uh, Henry V wooing uh, the French princess uh, Catherine. Uh, uh, it is an attempt to shape a comic ending to this play. Uh, this is a play that's had a lot of tragic moments in it and a lot of death uh, at this point. Uh, and uh, Shakespeare is presenting a triumphant image uh, of uh, uh, Henry V. Indeed, in this prologue, as we've seen, he's given what amounts to a Roman triumph back in uh, London. Uh, and uh, Shakespeare wants to end on an upbeat, on a positive note. There's a lot of comedy, as we'll see in this fifth act. And it indeed, it is a comic ending to the play because it leads up to a marriage. Uh, uh, in the standard form, you know, tragedy ends in death and comedy ends in marriage. Lord Byron said it's pretty much the same thing, uh, but it really does make a difference in the world of uh, a drama. And indeed, I'll remind you that this is really the fourth play in a set of uh, four, and it's meant to 
sh uh, shape a comic ending to the whole sequence of Richard II, Henry IV, Part I and II, and Henry V. Shakespeare had built up an enormously tragic uh, uh, portrait of political life in these plays and lots of people dying, so he wanted to end with this uh, uh, a very comic fifth act which takes us uh, uh, to the world of, uh, of, of marriage. Uh, uh, but it actually again, fits in with his larger program here, uh, and to put it bluntly and overstated, Shakespeare hates the Middle Ages. Uh, these plays are all about, the, the, this, these four plays are about getting from the uh, medieval world and the medieval, medieval kingship to what to Shakespeare would look like the modern world. Uh, uh, and one aspect of that we've seen, the French really represent the Middle Ages uh, in the play. They're the ones who live by chivalry, uh, uh, who think of themselves as individual knights in shining armor, winning glory. Henry presents himself as the king of a united people of a modern nation, uh, leading them into battle, and that uh, Shakespeare, you know, downplays the strategic aspects of the victory, the technological aspects of the victory. By the way, if you read the the Holland's Head in the back of your book, Holland's Head talks all about the archers and the importance of the arrows and all that. Shakespeare knew all that. It just he tends to suppress it and tries to present it as a kind of political achievement that that Henry creates. Uh, almost what we would call a modern nation here, uh, where, the, where the, no, the nobles and the people uh, are uh, behind him. Uh, uh, now notice that one aspect of the French medieval chivalric types is poetry. They write sonnets to their horses and they write sonnets to their mistresses. And Shakespeare sees this as all of a piece, uh, this medieval civilization. Uh, it consists of chivalry, again, these notions of individual knights pursuing their glory. It cons uh, consists of uh, courtly love, this whole dream of uh, wonderful mistresses that you write sonnets to. It consists of ideas of crusades and going on holy wars. Uh, uh, Shakespeare shows a need to come back to earth and for example, reshape the Holy War into a nice productive war against France, which is just across the English Channel and not all the way off uh, 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 in the Middle East. Uh, and so uh, there's a similar treatment of love uh, in this uh, fifth act. Uh, it's an attempt to get love off the pedestal, especially get the mistress off the pedestal and present down to love as a more down to earth phenomenon here. I'll put it to you in the terms that we've learned. This is more like marrying Octavia than having a love affair uh, with Cleopatra. Uh, that is, this, this love is highly negotiated. Uh, uh, we know it is part and parcel of the political solution that Henry will allow the current French king to live out his life on the throne with the proviso that Henry is married to the French princess and that upon the death of the French king, Henry will inherit all of France. Didn't quite work out that way for reasons we'll talk about in a few minutes, but, but in any case, that's the deal that's being wrought here. It's brokered by the Duke of Burgundy. Uh, uh, we've seen that scene where where Catherine was learning English, we'll come back to that scene, but that's a pretty ominous scene there when she's learning English as if they're already realizing, we may have some negotiating to do here uh, and we may have to marry Catherine to Henry, so let's, let's school her in English. So do see that this is as political a marriage as there could possibly be. Uh, they haven't, like Romeo and Juliet, met at a masked ball even though they're from warring factions and against their will <coughs> fall in love. <coughs> in, in fact, this thing was negotiated uh, uh, <coughs> quite clearly and has the backing of the King of France. And Henry could have presented it that way and Shakespeare could have presented it that way. But 
it's a further sign of how political Henry V is that he knows a political marriage cannot be presented as a political marriage, especially to the woman involved. Uh, and so he's going to show up and woo her as if this has nothing to do with politics uh, and it's all uh, his, his uh, love for her. So bottom of page 117. Fair Catherine and most fair, will you vouchsafe? Uh, so this is Act 5, Scene 2, about line 100. <coughs> fair Catherine and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach the soldier terms such as will enter a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Uh, and so this is presented now uh, as a, a, a love affair. Uh, and Henry is going to have to use, again, all his rhetorical skills to make this work. But again, I'll point you to the fact that the scene is in prose. This is a dead giveaway to us. Shakespeare was able to write love poetry. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> How many of you have read Romeo and Juliet or seen it? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, you know, the greatest love poetry ever written there. Uh, uh, and Shakespeare knows how to turn it on. But what's interesting is this scene seems to be written against that very conception of love. Uh, uh, and you see it uh, particularly uh, at line 152. So this is page 119. Uh, I speak to thee, plain soldier. If thou can love me for this, take me. If not, to say to thee that I shall die is true, but for thy love by the Lord, no. Yet I love thee too. That's so magnificent. I mean, the greatest claim of all lovers is I would die for you, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, it's acted out in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, they claim they would die for each other, and the plot works out so they can each die for each other. I showed you how that logic works out with Antony and Cleopatra as well. This is the notion of infinite love, of a love that finds new heaven and earth, that goes beyond this world, uh, of the eternal love. It's where the two lovers will die for each other. To the practical political Henry V, that's no good, especially since this marriage is supposed to uh, result in the union of France and England. So he actually denies the premise of all medieval love poetry. This is courtly love. Uh, if you know anything about Renaissance love poetry, it's the love poetry of Francesca Petrarch. It's the love poetry of Dante. But uh, if not to say to thee that I shall die is true, but for thy love by the Lord, no. <laughs> Yet I love thee too. Uh, and his whole strategy here uh, is to present himself as not eloquent. You might remember this uh, from... Uh, uh, Mark Antony. Uh, the whole claim here uh, is that he speaks uh, to her as a plain soldier. Uh, again, line 152, I speak to thee plain soldier. Uh, in effect, he uh, makes a virtue of his rhetorical defect here. He's claiming, I'm no big lover, I'm no smooth-talking courtier, I'm just an honest, plain soldier, I'm going to tell you what the truth is. Now, of course, that's ridiculous. I mean, this is part of a whole political plan uh, on his part here. Uh, but he does a good job of it. And uh, notice he, line 160, he has contempt for these fellows of infinite tongue. That would be these French chivalric lords who write sonnets to their mistresses uh, and their uh, horses here. And, he, and, and again, what we see in him is his great rhetoric. Line, page 120, line 175, when Catherine says, is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? <laughs> he says, no, it is not possible you should love the enemy of France, Kate, but in loving me, you should love the friend of France, for I love France so well that I will not part with a village of it. I will have it my, all mine. Uh, I mean, there's a kind of crazy honesty uh, in this sequence where uh, he reveals his political strategy even in the course of trying to deny it. Uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous, a marvelous scene. And then finally it builds up this passage I referred to a couple of times on page 121. Uh, so Act 5, Scene 2, about line 215. Shall not thou and I between St. Denis and St. George compound a boy half French, half English, that shall go to Constantinople and take the Turk by the beard? Uh, this shows, again, how political this marriage is. It's really an alliance. And notice also that the marriage will issue in 
children. Uh, uh, they're going to compound a boy. Uh, so much of uh, medieval love poetry connects love and death, uh, ignores the, the function of generation uh, in, in, in love. Uh, again, Romeo and Juliet are not going to have children. Indeed, we cannot picture their kind of love if they had children, Romeo and Juliet, going to the PTA meeting in, the state, in an SUV to hear how their little kids were doing in the Verona classroom. Uh, no, it's such an absolute, it must transcend any ordinary considerations that normal human beings have, like having a family. But no, here love is directed towards the end of uh, a generation and producing uh, this alliance. We're going to see a bit of this in Merchant of Venice. I'll say more generally that the great theme of Shakespearean comedy is to counter the kind of exaggerated infinite love that you see in medieval and early Renaissance love poetry uh, that, uh, again, we'll work this out in terms of Merchant of Venice, though it's clearer in plays like As You Like It and Much Ado About Nothing and Twelfth Night, uh, that Shakespeare had it in for love poetry, for the kind of love poetry that prevailed in his day, where basically lovers are saying, I'll die for you. You know, what kind of marriage is that going to make? What kind of community is that going to leave if the lovers are just dying? Uh, as the consummation of their love. There's something very practical about Shakespeare's attitude towards love, and you see it in the comedies. By the way, how many of you have read Don Quixote? How many of you have heard of Don Quixote? Yeah, okay. I mean, this is a very curious fact, but Shakespeare and Cervantes uh, were doing virtually the same thing. And they're very close contemporaries. They died on the same date. Uh, April 23rd, 1616, the worst date in world literature. Lost. Now, it happened not to be the same day because England and Spain were on different calendars at this point. It was two weeks apart. But it's still kind of freaky that on their tombstones, well, April 23rd, 1616. Uh, and Don Quixote is all about uh, satirizing courtly love and chivalry and showing how impractical they are, and a world built on these principles, these medieval principles, is built on sand. I mean, that's the great theme of Don Quixote, and Shakespeare's doing something very similar in his histories and uh, uh, his comedies. Again, I, I just give you that thought to contemplate. We can't do Don Quixote as well in this course, but we'll see more of this as we talk about comedy in uh, uh, Merchant of Venice. So, uh, there, there is then this kind of thoroughgoing critique of the whole medieval world, its view of love, its view of politics, uh, and what Shakespeare images here is the emergence of a modern monarch, and that means a centralized monarch. Uh, it was the Tudor dynasty that began to introduce the idea of absolute monarchy uh, in England, and Shakespeare, in effect, shows the principles of that uh, here. What he ultimately thinks of this is very hard to judge. Uh, 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 and I'll talk about it in terms of the problem of empire. Uh, this is a play about empire. I mean, Henry's notion is to start creating a British empire. And empire begins at home. Uh, as we see very strongly in this play, uh, Henry has to uh, put together Great Britain or the United Kingdom that he has to unite the Scottish, the Irish, and the Welsh behind the throne. And there's, it's developed particularly in terms of the Welsh uh, in the play. If you look at page 75, uh, uh, when Henry's in the role of Harry Leroy, Leroy uh, so Act 4, Scene 1, Line 51, he says, no, I am a Welshman. And this is an important motif. Henry V was born uh, in Wales. Uh, the, uh, we see this picked up again, page uh, uh, 76, uh, line 85. Uh, Henry says of Llewellyn, there is much care and valor in this Welshman. So we see this embrace uh, uh, the, uh, uh, by the monarch of the Welsh uh, carried out again at line 101. Uh, now Henry in his 
public persona as the king. So Act 4, Scene 7, Line 107, I wear it for a memorable honor, for I am Welsh, you know, good countryman. He embraces his Welshness. And then his defense of Welshmen on page 113, this is Gower speaking, uh, but he's speaking for Henry here. This is Act 5, Scene 1, uh, line 878. You thought because he could not speak English in a native garb, he could not therefore handle an English cudgel. You find it otherwise, and henceforth, let a Welsh correction teach you a good English condition. Very well. And so a part of creating Great Britain is so that uh, the English don't have contempt for the Welsh anymore. And as you may know, Prince Charles is the Prince of Wales. To this day, as a kind of gesture towards the Welsh, they call the heir uh, apparent, uh, the Prince of Wales. Uh, evidently, this goes back to the Middle Ages where to placate the Welsh, the English king said, uh, your, your next king will be born in Wales and he won't speak a word of English. And so he had his infant proclaimed uh, Prince of Wales. And the next king, uh, uh, he had been born in Wales and he didn't speak a word of English because he was still an infant. Anyway, big uh, king joke there. Uh, but... Uh, uh, so there's a real hope here that you could use imperialism to unite an otherwise potentially divided country behind you. And we see this as the strategy here to get uh, the war against France uh, to bring uh, the Welsh, the Irish, and the Scots uh, behind uh, uh, the British throne. Uh, but I wonder how successful Shakespeare thinks this can be. Because we see how hard it is to get the English uh, together with the Welsh and the Irish and the Scottish, for that matter, to get the Welsh and the Irish and the Scottish together, because we see them quarreling uh, and all this what is my nation stuff and why are you doing jokes against the Irish and so on. So how is this going to work now with the French? How are we going to create this super nation uh, having barely, if at all, gotten the Welsh, Irish, Scottish, and English together, is Henry going to absorb the French? Uh, and we see this uh, in terms of the most remarkable scene in the play, maybe the most remarkable scene in all of Shakespeare, Act 3, Scene 4, the entire scene in French. Uh, now, again, only Shakespeare, Shakespeare could bring this off. This violates every principle of dramaturgy in human history. Uh, you always write the play in the language of your audience. If you go back to the beginning of drama as we have it, Aeschylus of the Persians is written in Attic Greek. It's not written in Persian. Uh, look at Star Trek. The Enterprise goes all over the galaxy Everybody they meet in the galaxy speaks perfect English, usually with less of an accent than Scotty. This is the way drama works. You give people their own language. And Shakespeare doesn't mess around here. He creates a whole scene in French, and it works. It works in the case of you're reading it, if you don't know French, uh, by the fact that we have footnotes. But this actually works on the stage. Uh, and you watch the, the Brano film handles the scene wonderfully. Uh, uh, you would think, <laughs> I could just picture the guys in Shakespeare's theater coming saying, Bill, this is crazy. The whole scene in French, give me a break. He says, wait, wait, you'll see it works. I'm Shakespeare. Uh, uh, and it works because it's a language lesson. And we pretty quickly figure out it's a language lesson. And so we see a lot of pointing in this scene. You point to an arm and give the name in French and then the name in English. And we figure that out. We can start to follow it. Oh, it's a language lesson. Oh, she's learning the name for arm. She's learning the name for uh, neck and, and so on. That means, though, <laughs> uh, that... Languages translate only on the material plane, only on the level of the body. That is, uh, languages translate easily into each other when we're just naming parts of the body. Because the French have necks and the English have necks. The French have chins and the English have chins and so on. So, uh, and it, it's the point I made about Henry uh, that, that he said the I'm a, the king is just like a man because he smells things the same way. There's this sense here that human beings are united 
but only on a lower level, the level of material things, the level of the body. That if you want languages to translate simply into each other, you have to do it uh, uh, on the level of the bodies that human beings share. We will see how this comes up with Shylock in Merchant of Venice. But look at page 55, uh, 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 and uh, uh, you'll see uh, I'll work with the English here, so the, the footnotes, you know, de sin, le col nec, lemon de sin. When they go to say the word chin in their somewhat fractured French, it comes out sin. So it's, <laughs> here the translation fails when in a pun uh, the French word comes out as sin. Uh, what looks like just the innocent chin in English comes out as sin in French. Then it gets worse when they come to the words uh, pied and baroque. The words then come out as your, uh, <laughs> as your uh, notes chastely point out. They come out as the two major four-letter words in French. If I were not on live TV here, I would say the words in class, but I'm not going to be recorded <laughs> saying them. But just picture two worst four-letter words, and that's what we're talking about here. And so, you know, like, like with the case of gown, in English, the word gown uh, is what covers what the word in French sounds like. Uh, so uh, what started out uh, as easy translation here, uh, there's some slippage uh, here. It, uh, w w words that sound innocent in English start to sound pretty, uh, uh, well, sound obscene uh, in French. And here's the problem, uh, that people can be united on the simple level of the body, that's what they share. But when it comes to curse words, for example, uh, or as we'll see in uh, Merchant of Venice ethnic jokes, their people are divided by language instead of united by them. Uh, uh, and so this scene, which, uh, by the way, is at the exact center of the play. It's at the central scene of the central act. This play scene suggests, yeah, uh, people can learn to communicate across languages, but there are these mistakes that happen and these moments when one language's proprieties turn out to be another language's obscenities. And there are many famous examples. I think I could try this on TV. Uh, this is the OK symbol in the United States. I gather it's a really obscene gesture in Brazil. Anybody here from Brazil? But some American actor went down there and they said, what do you think of Brazil? And he went, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like giving the finger to the whole of the country, like an international incident. But it's just what we're talking about here that Shakespeare's showing. I uh, hope there's no Brazilian television covering this. Uh, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, it's not so easy to unite people. There's this phenomenon of language. Uh, and we, we see a lot of this play is about learning languages. You'll also, if you go through it, there are a number of mistakes uh, b between the French and the English soldiers. Uh, when one speaks French and one mistakes uh, a word in English for a word in French. Uh, the famous uh, line about England and America, uh, two people divided by a common language. Uh, 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 and so... Uh, uh, what we see is this real problematic, uh, again, that word, what is my nation? Today, we've conflated the word nation with the word state. We still remember to hyphenate nation state. Nation originally meant a people, almost you could say a race. It was not a political name. Uh, 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 really until the 19th century when they spliced it, with nation-state, with the idea that every nation should have its own state and every state should be one nation. That was the idea of 19th century European nationalism and the famous settlement uh, after World War I of trying to give each people in Europe their own nation. We're still dealing with the consequences of trying to divide up the world. In Shakespeare's day, nation still meant uh, a, a, a people, uh, the Irish nation didn't mean the Irish state, and indeed, as we see, the, like the Welsh people don't have a Welsh state anymore. So this is, uh, Shakespeare in a way raises such an important problem of modern politics here. 
How do we core, you know, what is my nation? How do we coordinate the nation with the state? The argument uh, on one level seems to be, well, uh, this Machiavellian policy, pursue foreign wars, uh, use that to make a one state out of the nations within your boundaries. And yet the question is, uh, uh, will this work? Will the French and the English be united? Now, historically, they were not. I mean, Shakespeare cannot, out of his hat, pull the idea that some super uh, English-French nation will be created. And indeed, if you look at the very end of the play, uh, we see something of the limit of politics. This is page 127, the epilogue, about line 10. Uh, and of it left his son, imperial lord, Henry VI, in infant bands, crowned king of France and England, did this king succeed, whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed. So Shakespeare presents Henry V as about as great a king as you could have. Uh, and the sign of his greatness is an imperial greatness that he's able to lead the English to a victory over France. This seems to be you know, what a monarch can do at his best. Nevertheless, the defect of the monarchy is always succession. Uh, and you may be the greatest king ever. There's no guarantee that your son will be. And in fact, Henry VI uh, worked out to be a disaster. As Shakespeare points out, he'd already written plays about that to show it. Some of it is just the luck of the draw. Heredity doesn't run true. A uh, great man can have a really worthless son. M maybe the problem is that <coughs> Henry V died prematurely and Henry VI had come to the throne uh, as a boy and he endured a regency and the barons took over and ruled things for him. Uh, Shakespeare does suggest, uh, aside from just the luck of the draw aspect of the succession, being raised as a king often disqualifies you from being a good king. Now, he, uh, again, if we'd read Henry IV, part one and two, we would have seen that Shakespeare shows an unusual process of education of Prince Hal that fits him for the king, uh, kingship rather than unfitting him. But anyway, what you see here is a lot of problematic aspects to Henry's achievement. Uh, and I always remind you that although Shakespeare is very interested in politics, he's also very aware of the limits of politics. Here is about as good a king as one could reasonably expect. A truly remarkable man who's in control of himself, in control of his kingdom, who can be kind, who can be valorous, who can turn from one to the other, uh, who can do the Machiavellian things without acquiring a reputation for Machiavellianism and therefore making him all the more successful as a Machiavellian. And yet, in the end, his achievement proved brittle and ephemeral. Uh, yes, he looked to have conquered France and absorbed it, but it never happened. By the way, Catherine turns out to be a witch in the Henry VI plays. She's awful uh, for England and, and, and works against everything Henry V had in mind. But th that's that chancy aspect of politics, uh, that, that uh, your achievement is uncertain because it's subject to so many contingencies, including just the contingency of heredity and the contingencies of how long you're going to live. But again, it goes deeper than that, because I'll remind you that what Shakespeare shows of this wonderful, admirable king is that he killed those prisoners uh, and then, in effect, lied about it. Uh, and that's, you know, again, I, I, I offer Henry V as Shakespeare's portrait of about the best a political man could be, but I think there are other standards by which one can judge politics uh, that might make one wonder whether it's the highest human achievement or the highest way of life. So as I stress the political aspects, Shakespeare, I always want to stress at the same time, Shakespeare's awareness of the limits of political life, the dangers of it, the temptations of it. That, again, is why he's a tragic writer, uh, that he can understand the value of politics, but he can also understand the values that it comes in conflict. Uh, for, to kill those prisoners is a kind of ultimate political act which saves your people uh, uh, and in some sense is a, a great political act. And yet, what does it take out of a man to give a callous, really ugly act 
like that. That's the kind of uh, uh, question Shakespeare poses for us. This play is a history play. As I try to show you, he tries to end it with as much comedy as he can to try to uh, give it positively. But you can start to see here, I think, where Shakespeare's going with tragedy, especially that these classical and Christian values clash. And we're going to take a bit off with a comedy, Merchant of Venice, but we'll come back and see this uh, in Hamlet. So kept on schedule, on to Merchant of Venice uh, next time, uh, where we'll start looking at a republic again. <laughs>